Hey, before, hey, listen up. Before you you take a seat, today is uh, Name Tag Sunday, after all, and we're going to greet each other. So you might want to get up to do that. And uh, here's the thing. Take a few minutes. See somebody new. See someone that you've been, seen before. Look at their name tag. This is an amnesty day. You get a free pass on forgetting people's names in the past. Just look at their name tag. We could do this all day, but we're not. We're not going to do that all day. There is, by the way, there's uh, the monthly lunch today right after this. So you can pick up the conversations right after we're, we're done here in, th in this room. Okay, so if you have a name tag on, I've got a banjo on my name tag because someone, some people really love me. They made them special for me. So I, every month I look forward to getting to put a banjo here. But... I know that doesn't thrill anybody else but me, but that's okay. I'm praying for you. That's good. Oh, but uh, there is a, there is, did you meet Lazarus? Yeah. He, where, where is he? There again. Well, he, he's somewhere. Right back there. J. Laz. J. Laz. He put, I, I actually, if you don't know that story, you want to find out, talk to J. Laz after, at lunch. Take, you know, take him to lunch. It's, it's a cheap day today. You can take him to a free lunch. Okay, that's a good thing. Now, um, we have um, a number of our guys up the hill coming home probably right about now. They're in about, you know, they're heading down from Angeles Crest from the men's uh, advance. And uh, a couple of us came home last night to be here this morning. And, uh, but, man, it's been such a great time. Thank you for praying for them. And let's continue to pray. And we'll, let's pray in a minute about their safety coming down when we pray for the message. But we have life groups that are going on now. And if you're yet, not yet in a life group, we want to encourage you, there's still time to jump into one. And so I've asked Bob and Michelle Sprague to come up wherever they are. Come on up here, guys. Uh, we're going to ask them a couple of uh, questions about their involvement. Make your way over here, if you would. I'm going to hand this to you, Michelle, so you can control the mic. Um, uh, w let me ask you, uh, why did you get involved in a life group when you came to G Gold Coast? First of all, thank you for holding your applause. It would be disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to, uh, Michelle and I wanted to be in a Bible study together, and also we wanted to connect with the church. It's uh, uh, much easier to do in a small setting than, than a big one. And it's hard to say no to uh, the pastor. Scott did ask us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you're in, you're in one of the best life groups we've got, right? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but, but, you know, I knew if I asked them to be interviewed, you know, there's that pressure. They're, you know, again, they're in our life group. So uh, what do you like best about your experience with the life groups? I mean, I'm assuming you like something about them. I mean, that's. The banjo is always great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We 
have uh, fellowships that have turned into friendships, and we're diverse enough so everybody brings a different perspective to the study, and so it, it's very educational, very informative, and our desserts are outstanding. <laughs> Um, basically, it's been fun to do outside activities. We've been to concerts, we've had barbecues. Um, it's just been fun to hang out outside of, you know, just regular um, time together, yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's fun to be together on a weekly basis, but it's also fun to go outside of that. Yeah. Let our hair down a little. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a ball joke, okay. <laughs> no. I'm not on here for five minutes and we do a ball joke. Good. <laughs> <laughs> did Scott go there? Yes, he Come did. On. No, I, I, no, you, <laughs> hey, it's, it's going, I'm, I'm right behind you, brother. Okay, so one last question, that is, for anyone who might be thinking about maybe trying on a life group, who's a, who's hesitant perhaps, what, what advice would you give them to maybe pull the trigger? Everybody here wants to follow Christ, I think, or you wouldn't be here. Thank you. And uh, when you are in a, a small group, you're studying the word, which is following Christ, and you're trying to do Christian fellowship, which is also following Christ. So you're within the will of God, and you'll probably have fun, and you'll probably make friends. Yeah, I think um, for me, small groups were what um, grew my faith and helped me uh, learn about Jesus in a better way, in a more intimate way. So um, small groups have always been a part of my walk. Excellent. Let's give it up. To the spray. Thank you. Thanks for bring, being brave. I'm, I, can, uh, Jimmy, can you, can, can you just, oh, here, okay. Denise is going to come all the way. Thank you. I should have had some place to put that. All right. So if you need a Bible, now's the time to get in, uh, open your Bibles to actually Numbers chapter 12. In the Old Testament, early in the, er, one of the first books in the New Testament, uh, it's, it's, I don't know what, I'm not sure what page it's found, not at all, what's in the church issued Bible. If you need a Bible, we've got Bibles. If you want to look at on, I really encourage you to have a Bible in front of you. So if you've got it on your phone, that's where you look at your Bible, that's great. If you need a Bible, you didn't bring a Bible, Randy's got Bibles, no one's got Bibles, raise your hand. And then pull your message notes out, because we're going to jump into this, uh, this text. We need to look at it together. Um, and, uh. Just want to encourage you too. Next, by the, before we jump in, as they're passing out Bibles, you're opening your Bible on your phone. Um, next Sunday is Mother's Day, and we're going to have a special gift, not just for all the mothers here, but for all uh, wives, mothers, even and single ladies who manifest the caring heart of, of motherhood. Because you're, mothers are not just those who give birth. I mean, in our society, people who have mothering instincts, we want to applaud them. And so we got a special gift for you, moms. There's going to be a photo booth out in the lobby to take fun pictures with family, households, friends, whatever you want to do. It's going to make a special day of it next Sunday. So make sure you're here. Invite friends to join you. And uh, how many of you, um, in maybe meeting someone this morning uh, and hearing what was going on in someone else's life, got really envious? <laughs> I know that's a weird way to start a message, right? Envious? I. Uh, we're going to find out that envy is right around the corner for any of us. When we hear about this or hear about that, it's so easy in our community, in our society today, our culture, to become envious. And we're going to actually look at Miriam, who is the old, older sister of Moses. We began this series last week called Heroes and Zeros, in which we're looking at Old Testament characters and people and individuals who are models to us of both good things to to Follow in bad things to avoid. So we're going to look at, kind of as, at case studies throughout the Old Testament of different people who exemplify things that will draw us closer to God. Or maybe some people we'll look at who are a mix of those who would draw us closer, those who would push us away from God. Or maybe just outright people who you do, do not want to follow at all and uh, make sure you don't do anything they do. Today we're going to look at someone who's a mixed bag. But she also is a case study for us in the, uh, in the area of envy. Because she goes through a time in her life when she envies Moses. And we find her story in Numbers chapter 12. So I encourage you to have that opened. And we'll make our way through the passage. And then we'll pray in, in just a moment. But let me just start with a question. And that is, how many of you have a problem? Show of hands. Show of hands with envy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Now think about that. 
Some of you are looking at the, those people who raise their hands, and you're, you're thinking, man, I wish I would have the courage to do that. That's envy. That's envying them, right? I mean, it's so easy for us to envy people. And by the way, let's give a, a hand of applause to those who were brave enough to raise their hand. Because that's not an easy sin to admit. But the reality is, every hand should go up. Let's go ahead. Every hand goes up. We have all have problems with envy from time to time. And so we're going to jump in and look at what we can learn from Miriam and her example. And, uh, it, you know, over the years I've had people ask, uh, you know, ask us as a church, uh, why don't you preach on this or why don't you teach on that? And they, they, they suggest topics or books. I've never had one person say, would you st- please, please preach on envy. Right? That should tell us something. And so let's jump in. Today we're going to see what envy really is. We're going to see why it's really a problem. And then we're going to see how we can overcome it and how we, it can be overcome. So, again, we're going to look, what envy, look at what envy is, why it's a problem, and then how it can be overcome. And we're looking at Numbers chapter 12. Now, where, where, where in the history of Israel is Numbers 12? Where, where does that pop up? Well, um, God has sent Moses. We looked at Moses' life, the beginning of Ms. Moses' life last Sunday as this series got kicked off. Remember that? And God called Moses to lead the people out of where, what country? Out of Egypt into the promised land. And so God has delivered the, the Hebrew people, uh, the children of Israel, out of Egyptian captivity, has led them out from bondage through the Red Sea, and now they are um, in the wilderness heading to the promised land. That's, what, that's the context. So let's jump in. I'll read it out loud. If you'll follow along together with me, that would be great. I think I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. So your version if, it might be a little different, but that's okay. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoke only through Moses? Now, he, so what we're seeing right off the bat, Moses married a non-Israelite. He, he married a non-Hebrew. And they're, they're making criticisms of him because of that. And then they're extending that onto his leadership. And, he's, and they say, has uh, the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through who? Us also. Do you, do you start to sense the envy going on here? Okay. Um, And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. Now he wrote this, right? First five books of the Bible written by Moses. Now, you know, you read that and you think, okay, how did that work? You know, it's it's hard to be humble, you know. You know, I think Mac Davis sang a song about that, right? Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in so many ways, right? Um. But Moses wrote that. Here's what I think is really interesting about that. What's their accusation against Moses? You think you're tough stuff. You're kind of being up there, away above us. And God's going like, Moses, write this down. You are the meekest guy I know. This is not about you. So that's another key indication, a key indicator on how we're supposed to interpret this text. He's, He's not what they're accusing him of being. Right? Or doing what they're accusing him of doing. So suddenly, verse 4. Oh, here's where God kicks in some consequence. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him. In a vision, I speak with them, with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, no, I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, like snow. 
just, just her, not Aaron. Now, why is that? Because, you know, this is about Miriam. Uh, Aaron has hitched his star to his older sister. I mean, yeah, Aaron has hitched his star to Miriam. But Miriam's the one being disciplined. Why? Well, think about Aaron. Aaron is kind of like just going along. Most scholars believe he was just, a, he was just following Miriam's lead. We know he's kind of a follower of people, right? Exodus chapter 32. We don't have time to get into that. What happens? Moses is up on uh, the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, the law of God, and Aaron's left in charge of the nation of Israel. When he comes down the mountain, what has Aaron done for the people? He's formed a false idol, a golden calf for the people to worship. Why? Because they asked him to. I mean, he's easily influenced. So that's why, just by, by, you know, by the way, why this is all about Miriam, you know. I mean, he's just going along for the ride. And she's the instigator. And she's talked him into it, most likely. I mean, just kind of, yeah, whatever you say, sis. You know. And so here comes the punishment. She is full of leprosy, like snow, white as snow. And Aaron turns toward Miriam. And behold, she's leprous. And Aaron says to Moses, oh, my Lord, don't punish us. Because we have done foolishly and have sinned, let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. I mean, what a picture is that? And Moses cried to the Lord, oh, God, please heal her. Please. But the Lord, now think about, again, we're not looking at Moses here, but what is Moses' heart? Love, kindness, forgiveness, grace. He's not going, yeah, good, God, you finally gave it to her. No, he's like, no, please, no, God. But the Lord said to her, listen, basically in your culture, if her father had, had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? She's done something far, far worse, in other words. Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazareth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Okay. Father, we pray that you'll help us go to school on Miriam and learn lessons she had to learn the hard way that we don't have to if we'll just be wise and open and vulnerable before you. So God, show us what we need to learn today. Each one of us, it might be something different, but may we be focused on you and your word today and may it penetrate to the very core of our hearts. We pray this all for Jesus' sake and glory. Amen. And so, as we get started, what, is that, what exactly is envy? On your outline, you know, I want to write this down. Envy is a desire for what someone else has. There's all kinds of definitions. This is what we're going to work on. We're going to expand this. But off the bat, let's just agree to the simple understanding. Envy is that desire within us for what someone else has. It can be looks. Their appearance, their brains, their talent, their achievements, their accomplishments, their status, their relationships, the vacations they take, you know. Marion is here in this context, and she's envious of what? Of Moses. Why? Because he's got the status, he's got the position, he's got the influence that she wants for herself and doesn't have that. And there's more opportunity than ever before for us to experience envy, right? In all the world's history, we, we are more susceptible to envy because there's so many more opportunities. I mean, so nowadays, we don't just compare ourselves to friends and family and neighbors as the people have always done up until our modern age. But now, with social media, <laughs> right, we measure up against People all over the world, celebrities and strangers, friends of friends. If we're not careful, um, we can compare our lives to the best lives and the best parts of people we don't even know. And what we see on social media has been filtered and photoshopped oftentimes. And we're like, wow, I want that and I don't have that. That's envy. It's all around us. One therapist, one therapist calls this malady comparisonitis. Do you suffer from comparisonitis? It leads to envy. Studies actually show more, the more, they show this over and over again, the more and more time 
someone spends on social media, the more envious they become. Just the, what, what the facts are, which leads to all kinds of problems. Depression. So we, let's just off the, bat, off the bat, as we get started this morning, let's just all agree and admit we can be envious. Isn't that true? We all struggle with envy like this, like this, like this guy. Take a look. Sometimes I feel a little jealous of people. My, this is self-admission from the pastor. But then I remember that I play banjo and they don't. Losers. I feel better now. That's envy. And you're going, I don't struggle with that. Okay, well, that's good. That's one thing you have to, don't have to worry about. But Okay, Let's, you can take that off. I, right, right, is it off? Okay, go ahead, take it. That was a little comic relief. Okay. Now, think about it. Miriam is who to Moses, right? His older sister. She changed his diapers. Why would she be envious of him? Well, think about it. Older siblings. I know this kid. I'm, she's the one who, you know, was right there when Pharaoh's daughter saw baby, little baby Moses and said, hey, I know someone who can nurse him, Right? So she's just not another Hebrew. She's not just another Israelite. And she isn't just another, just a sister of Moses. Think about this. Her role, if you're not aware, Miriam is one of the key influencers in that culture, in that community. She's one of the top three leaders. She's the first prophetess, according to the Bible. First one called a prophet, a woman called, you know, who's called a prophet in the Bible is Miriam. She's a musician. She's a dancer who probably... Danced upon injustice, like we sang, right? And by the way, I'd love to see someone on that song sometime just do cool dance. I, I'm over there dancing, but you don't want to look over there when I do that. But, but you know, she, she was a singer. She was a poet. Micah 6.4, mark it if you want to look it up later. Micah 6.4 says, indeed, God speaking, God speaking, saying, indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I ransomed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you, Who? Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. She's mentioned in scripture as a key leader. She's had a tremendous life, a lot of influence, a lot of responsibility. But Miriam got envious. Why? Because it wasn't enough. She looked at someone ahead of her, above her, someone who God was using in a different way and that she wanted to be used in that way, and she wasn't. That's pretty scary. She sees her brother and she, what he has, and she wants that too. And so envy goes way back in mankind's history. It goes back further than this, right? Do you realize the first time the word sin is mentioned in the Bible is in a story about envy? Cain killing Abel. And he killed him out of envy. Rachel envied Leah. Leah, Ray, uh, in, Leah envied Rachel. His brothers envied Joseph, right? Saul envied David. How'd that turn out for Saul, by the way? <laughs> the chief priests envied Jesus, Mark chapter 15 tells us. It was out of envy they delivered him over to the authorities to be crucified. I mean, envy is a dangerous, dangerous thing. But it goes back even before Cain and Abel. It goes back to the garden. It goes back to paradise. Right? God puts Adam and Eve, first man and woman, in this beautiful garden. Who could ask for anything more? And yet, Satan comes along and says, did you, did you look at all? Did you, this is great. Did you look over, the, over here at this tree, though? Oh, yeah, we're not allowed to get in that tree. Oh, you really want to get in that tree, don't you? God does. Why can't you? And they began, began, began to become envious of what God even had. But it goes back before the garden. Before the world began. Envy was in the heavenlies, right? Why did Satan get kicked out of heaven? It was out of what? Envy of God. He wanted to be rivaled with God. He took a, a bunch of demons, a bunch of angels with him who fell. Out, and it was all due to envy. And wanting what they couldn't have. 
I mean, it's amazing when you stop and think about the power of envy, the danger of envy. Now, notice, if you take notes, you might want to write this next thing down. And that is, envy always focuses on somebody else. Envy always has this component that is, you're not just looking at the thing, you're looking at the person who has the thing as well. It's always more than just the desire for something. You want what someone else has. And if you can't have it, you don't want them, what? You don't want them to have it either. So it isn't so much about the item itself, it's about the person who has the thing you don't have. And that means, if you stop and think about it, it's even not even, focus, you're focusing on the, the uh, person, but who's, who is the, actually the, that wire lead back to? It's about how you relate to that person. It, it's about self-focus. It's about selfishness. It's about you're just concerned about you. You're on the throne. Envy look, is looking past all that you've got, all that you've been blessed with, and focuses on what you don't have and what someone else has. But here's the attitude that's attached to it. Okay, so another facet of envy. Okay, it's the attitude. Romans 12 says we are to rejoice with those who what? Rejoice and to mourn with those who? Yeah, or weep for those who weep. Envy just turns that whole thing upside down. Envy is like, they got what I want, and they're happy about it, and I'm, I'm upset. You know, I mourn over their happiness. Envy on your outline is sadness over others' blessings. It's a sadness over others' blessings. Envy is unhappy at other people's ha happiness. Envy weeps because of those who are rejoicing. And so when Moses is being used by God in a way that's really powerful, Miriam is sitting back upset that it's not her that God's using in that way. I mean, you can see, right, that, that just kind of reeks through this passage. She's not happy. She's upset. God's doing a great thing, but it's not through her. And that is not acceptable for her, to, to her. So um, let me ask you this question. All of us need to ask. Ant, ant, think about this and answer it for ourselves. When other people succeed, when other people are promoted, say, at work, are you really happy for them? When other people get things that you would kind of like for yourself, can you really, are you really rejoicing that they're getting that? Hopefully so, but oftentimes that's not the case, right? We're like, or even, yeah, but inside we're like going, right? And so, uh, notice this, uh, it also rejoices because they're weeping. <laughs> Happiness over their failures, their losses. Envy delights in the misfortunes of those you envy. We could spend time, hours probably coming up, if we were really honest, yeah, this happened, and then, I, yeah, I was kind of upset, I kind of bummed out. Or, or, yeah, this person I envied, they were taken down a notch, and woo, that felt good. Aristotle said the joy caused, uh, envy is the joy caused by your opponents or your, another's demise, right? The joy caused by their demise. You're pleased when that friend or a loved one suffers a setback. <clears throat> Rick Warren said even, or en envy is resenting God's goodness to others and ignoring God's goodness to yourself, Right? It's resenting what God's doing in other people's lives and ignoring all the ways God's been blessing you. So God takes this very seriously. Look at verse 2 again in our text. The Lord <coughs> says, the Lord heard the grumblings. Is it verse 2? I don't know if that's right. Uh, somewhere, but somewhere, I, don't, I had verse 2, but it's pretty early. It says, the Lord, the Lord heard the grumblings of Miriam and Aaron, and he immediately summoned them to a meeting. And we're told in verse 9, that the anger of the Lord burned against them. Man, when God's anger is burning, that's not a good thing. Right? Would you, we all agree to that? This is serious. Why does God see it as such a problem? <clears throat> What's the problem with envy? Uh, it's because it's one, it's not on your notes, but write down, it's terribly destructive. In fact, 
Some of you were with us not, not that long ago when we, went through the, we just went through the book of Galatians. You know, we just finished the book of Galatians. Chapter 5 talks about the, the, the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. And, I, you know, if you have that handy, uh, you might want to turn over. I just want to look at this real quickly. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 17. Uh, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. And they're opposed to each other. In other words, what this, and he's going to give a list. And he's saying, here are characteristics of the things that are anti-God. Here's the things that are anti-spirit, that God doesn't like, right? And one of those things, among sexual immorality and uh, idolatry, impurity, is jealousy and envy. And then he goes down, he goes down to say this. I warn you, as I warned you before in verse 21, that those who do such things, envy, jealousy, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, God's really serious about this stuff. And so we should too. So here's, here's a list. I think here's some blanks you can fill in. Uh, first one's a gimme. Uh, Julie Myers, who does this stuff, she says, are you sure you didn't want humiliating to be like a blank that people filled in? I go, no, I want to I toss them a bone. I want, to, I want to give them a break. Here's, so here's a, you don't even have to write this one down. It's right there for you. It is humiliating. Why do you think so few of us raised our hands to the question I started the sermon off with? Because it's humiliating. How many of us want to admit we're envious or jealous? It's like, it's really sad, but it's so true. Joseph Epstein writes this. The stigma of envy. The stigma of envy is its enormous pettiness. There is nothing more humiliating than to, have to, than, than to have to admit to somebody you're envious. Nothing more humiliating than that. Because it's so humiliating, we don't want to admit it's true. Because it's so petty, it unveils our egos and insecurities and we never want to admit that we're envious of someone so what do we do we try to hide it behind something else I mean isn't that what we see Miriam doing here she's not saying I'm jealous of you I'm envious of you no she's coming up with this smoke screen that she's hiding her envy behind it's oftentimes couched in criticism that's what we find here right isn't that true Underneath, oftentimes, judgmentalism is an envy. I judge others to make myself feel what? Better, yes. Because deep down, I envy them. So we belittle their accomplishments and their talents or their appearance. We badmouth them. We sabotage that person. Miriam and Aaron began to talk smack against Moses because of his Cushite wife. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us? They're just envious of his role as we've seen, his position, his relationship with God, how God is using him. It's just, it's just embarrassing to admit. And so we hide it behind criticism. Also, next, next one is envy poisons contentment. It drains us of joy. Again, Epstein on this says, of the seven deadly sins, I thought this was very insightful. Of the seven deadly sins, only envy is absolutely no fun at all. Isn't that true? Draining all joy from you from its very first moment. Almost all the other deadly sins in the beginning feel pretty good. <laughs> Let's take gluttony. Hey, <laughs> that's one of the seven deadly sins. Gluttony feels great at first. Absolutely great. Then the consequences kick in. Not so great, right? Right? Even anger, oh, how many of you love to let off steam? It feels so good. Just to vomit emotionally over everybody, right? Oh, I feel so much better now. Yeah, but what about all the stuff you just freight over everybody? Okay, not good. It feels great until all of this destructiveness starts to show up. But it's, and it's like that with all the other sins. Feel good at first, but envy makes you unhappy from the word go. It sucks all the joy out of your life. And for the very first second you do it, it robs you. That is so true. So in other words, you're so, we're so, when we're envious, we're so consumed in comparing what we have or don't have 
in relationship to what other people have or don't have, we can't even enjoy what we do have. And next, envy destroys gratitude then, right? We can't be grateful because it's not enough. We don't think it's enough. It ruins our ability to be grateful and to enjoy about what we have. And then it prevents us from being able, it, it, it prevents us from being able to obey what the psalmist commands us to do in Psalm 100. Enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving, his courts with praise. We can't do that when we're envious. Give thanks to him and praise his name, Psalm 104. Envy ruins relationships. God hates envy because it ruins relationships. The envy of Miriam and Aaron would have, was driving a wedge between them and Moses. But it doesn't just contain itself to those relationships. It impacted and influenced the entire community, didn't it? God struck Miriam with leprosy and had to be separated from the rest of the community. The children of Israel could not move for how many days? Seven days. Why are we, move? Why are we moving? Uh, Miriam. Come on, let's get the show on the road. No, Miriam. It impacted a bunch of people. God gets angry about our envy because he knows how divisive it is driving us into isolation from one another. So it not only makes us less happy with the things we have, it also harms those relationships God's blessed us with. What, it, what does it look like if we were to really rejoice with those who rejoice? That's the, God's vision for his church, right? When you succeed, we succeed. How much happiness would there be if envy was eliminated? James 3.16 says this, For where you have envy and selfish ambition... There you find disorder and every evil practice. Wow, that's a powerful statement. It's a powerful truth. Where you have envy, you have all, every kind of evil practice. Envy kills love. Write this down. Envy is the opposite of love. The love chapter is 1 Corinthians what? 13. Describes what love is, what real love is. And one of the things it says is, Love does not envy. And by the way, I'll say it again. We say this sometimes. Some people may, might, might wonder during our offering time, we always try to pray for every church on this coastal plain who loves Jesus. Why? Well, well that's good. Now, besides, I mean, what, what does that help us do? We pray for their success. What does that help us do, class? <laughs> it helps us combat envy because when they win, guess who wins? God wins. And guess who, and who's on God's team? We are on God's team. When they win, we win. When we win for, for the kingdom, when we extend the kingdom, they win. In Numbers 12, 9, the anger of the Lord burned against them and he, what? What's it say? Verse 12. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chapter 12, verse 9. Did I say that I must? So the anger of the Lord, verse 9. It burned against him and he what? <laughs> yes, think about that. Let that sink in. He left them. Yeah, you might say, yeah, he just left and he went back. You know, and yeah, it's true. He, yeah, he didn't totally leave them. But envy distances ourselves from each other and even from God. It breaks relationship with God. It's like until we repent of it, it's like God's going, come on, I'm waiting for you. Turn to me. Learn the lesson. I mean, it's a serious thing. God's angry because Miriam and Aaron thought they knew better than God. In verse uh, man, I typed that wrong. Verse 68. I, don't, I know there's no 68. But God explains to Miriam and Aaron that he had placed Moses over his house. What verse is that? Where he says, I placed him over all my house. When he's talking about, he comes and starts talking to Miriam and Aaron. What verse is that? Seven. I don't know what. I typed 68. Okay. Just threw me off. Verse seven. I knew there wasn't. Okay, I want you to look at verse Seven. Look what, look what it says there. He, 
placed Moses over all the house. God is the one who gave Moses his position. They're envious of something God did. It's not, you know, the person isn't the thing. It's always, when you're envious of someone, you're really, you're really upset with God. When we become envious, we're really accusing God of him not being who he should be or who he really is. We're trying to lower what God, we're trying to make ourselves the authority. When God is the one who distributes gifts and abilities, right? I mean, it's just an amazing thing. Who are we to be upset with God's assignments? 1 Corinthians 12. There, the body of Christ, us, we're likened to a human body. And one of us is a nose and another of us, another of us is a fingernail, right? And can the eye, should the eye be jealous of the foot and the foot be jealous of the eye? You might go, I'm a fingernail and I want to be an eye. And I'm upset I'm not an eye. Who, and Paul goes on, you're, who are you to, to judge God? He's the one who puts people together in the body the way he puts them together. Or Jesus tells a story in Matthew 25 about the master giving different, different amounts of talents out to his servants, right? One is given five, one is given two, and one is given one. God's the one who distributes things. He knows who we are and how much we can bear and what we should be doing, right? So who are we to be upset with God's assignment? Romans 9.20, who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? So you're a finger and not an eye. God knows what he's doing. You're a two-talent person and not a five-talent person. But you want to be a five-talent person. Guess what? God knows what he's doing. <laughs> so you're a Miriam or an Aaron or an attendant at the tabernacle. You're not Moses. Guess what? And you want to be. Guess what? God knows what he's doing. We forget that God is the potter and we are the clay. Isaiah 29. We read, can the pot, can the pot say to the potter, he knows nothing. <laughs> No, I mean, it's implied, no, that's a dumb thing to say. So overcoming envy, envy, overcoming envy. How do we move from comparison and resentment onto contentment and life? Notice just two things. Celebrate God's goodness to other people. Not outwardly. I mean, you can do that, yeah, do it outwardly, but make sure it's coming from the heart. Be happy. And rejoice with those who are getting blessed. You know, oh, what a great promotion. Great. Oh, what a great thing you were able to get. Man, that's, you know, oh, what a great car. That's great. Uh, or, oh, that's great. Your kids are doing well in school. Really genuinely be happy for people. Rejoice with others. Instead of spending time and energy wishing you had a different life or different gifts or abilities, celebrate what God has given to others. And then secondly, embrace God's goodness to you. Instead of comparing yourself with others, focus on God's goodness to you. Understand you don't deserve anything good you've got. Did you hear the pin drop? <laughs> and that's kind of a bold statement, but that will change your perspective. Any good thing I have, I don't deserve. You know what I do deserve? H E double L. I deserve hell. I do. I'm so thankful I don't get what I deserve. <laughs> Every second I'm not in hell, hey, that's a good day. <laughs> Isn't that true? Every day I'm not in hell, good day. You see, if everything else in my life falls apart, but I have Jesus, oh my. I've won the lottery. I still have more than I could ever dream of having, more than I could ever think I deserved. That's the perspective you and I both need, right? So question as we get ready to move into a time of communion, and that is, is Jesus enough for you? Is Jesus enough for me? Is Jesus enough? I heard an illustration this week, and I, I thought, man, this is really... 
right on, on the mark. Here, here's a story, illustration. You get married, and you go to your wife. So, okay, if you're, say, this is from the man's perspective. You go to your wife, and you say, honey, you promised to meet all my romantic sexual needs. I need you to talk to your friend and have them sleep with me because that will make me happy. I told you it's bold, right? It's like, what? Did I wake somebody up? Okay. Is she going to go, okay. No, 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 no. She's going to go, what, are you crazy? Why? She's going to say, I didn't promise to supply those things for you. I promised that I would be those things for you. I promised I would be the one you would look to, right? And herein lies a parable for all of us, right? Think about the, con- think about the, 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 the meaning of that. Some of us go to God like that, don't we? I'm, rubbing, the, I'm lo- rubbing this lamp just the right way, oh, genie in the bottle, God. And I've come to you because you're going to meet all my needs. What do you want? Do you want the being, the entity in the bottle, or do you want what the entity in the bottle can do for you? The latter, right? If all we have is God, isn't that enough? When we discover Jesus is truly our only real hope and really all we ever need, it will break envy's power in our lives and over our lives. And that's why our focus is not on others. It's not on us. It's on the cross. We need to be crazy about the cross of Jesus. That is our life. Our life is bound up in what he is and what he's done for us, right? That will erode your envy. That will take your envy off the plate. You have to have him. So the question this morning is, do you have Jesus? Would you close your eyes and bow your heads just for a moment? I want to say a word just to those in this place who have yet to pull the trigger on their commitment to, to, to Jesus. In other words, you're, you're thinking about Jesus, you're, you're interested in Jesus, you're being attracted to Jesus, but something's keeping you back. And, and, I, and I don't know what that is. Maybe only you know. Maybe you don't even know, but God knows. But maybe today God's revealing something about your relationship with him. And maybe it's this idea that Jesus hasn't been enough in your mind. You're afraid he's not going to be enough. Let me tell you, there'll be many people here who will testify 24-7, he is enough. He is enough. And if today, if he doesn't make sense to you, think about this. If the way the world is, I can't see how anyone can deny that the only way to save us was for Jesus to come and die in our place. When you really drill down on the meaning of the gospel, you'll find there is no other thought, no other philosophy, no other religion on the face of this planet ever that says the things that Jesus says and the things that the Bible says about who we are and who God is. And when you start to really think about that, reality will start to sink in. The only way for us to know life is through his, his death. And so if you don't yet know Jesus, would you just let us know about that today? Please don't put it off. If you need questions answered, if you got questions, please don't put off asking those questions. You can start that conversation today after the service or over lunch. Or, you know, ask for someone to meet with you. Go out to coffee. There's plenty of people in our church who would love to sit down and share with you their, their, their experience with Jesus and what the Bible says about knowing him and following him. We can help you in any way. Maybe today if you're ready. If not, you want to think about it. Let us know. Maybe on your card. Yeah, I'm willing to talk to somebody. I want information. We'd love to get that into your hands and help you make those those decisions and think through how you should make, you know, what, what, what the facts are. So please take advantage of that. For the rest of us in this place who know Jesus, when we come to this time in our service, communion is available for followers of Jesus this morning. And that reminds us again of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And he is enough. He's enough. So Father in heaven, we just... We glorify you. We revel in who you are and who you've called us to be and who you're making us into because it's all about you. It's all about you. 
So when we get our eyes off of you and onto other people, Father, we, we can't help but become envious because our focus is all, is all over the map. It's not where it needs to be. So, Father, use this time to refocus our focus. Help, help it always to be the cross that we focus on and what Jesus, how much you love us. If you be for us, who can be against us? Draw us close, Lord, and draw those who don't yet know you to you today. May it be today that they would say yes to your invitation to come and change them from the inside out and forgive them of their sins. And Father, not just, not just guarantee them heaven tomorrow, but they need Jesus today to get through this day. Help them to embrace him. And we'll give you all the credit, all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.